You think they killed him because he killed his people? Hell no. They killed him because, listen to me real good. You touched my nerve with that question. Did you know that in Libya, nobody's homeless? Listen, everybody in Libya has either a home or an apartment, they call it a flat. Did you know education in Libya is free from kindergarten through college? And did you know that if a Libyan wanted to come to America to be educated, the government in Libya paid for their education? Did you know that? I was there when he opened a $500 million hospital with 18 uh, theaters for operation. I was there, and we went when he was making their own medicines. See? Misty. This was a man that gave free medical attention to all the citizens of Libya, and if Libya did not offer that kind of medical attention, they could fly anywhere in the world and get it. And the Libyan government would pay for it. Did you know that? No, you didn't. Did you know that from the oil money, every Libyan citizen got a stipend every year? And did you know that that man had no debt? Everything in his country was paid for. See? Now when you got a man that did that for an African nation and was trying to do that for all Africa, how do you think Europe felt about that? Well, I was with Muammar Gaddafi when Gaddafi insert in 19... Union with a vision of the United States of Africa. Muammar Gaddafi spent, listen to me, billions of dollars to create the African Union. Did you know that Gaddafi gave 300 million dollars and the other African nations gave a hundred million to put up a satellite so that we who call Africa don't have to go through Europe to get to Africa. And Europe was getting five hundred million dollars a year just by our telephone calls to the continent. Now we can call directly to Africa and that five hundred million is in the hand of African people. Did you know that Muammar Gaddafi was setting up an African development bank with seventy billion dollars in the African Development Bank from Libyan oil money. Oh. That we would not have to borrow money from the IMF and the World Bank at these exorbitant rates. Zero interest oh. under Islamic non-usury teachings. I just left St. Kitts and in the island of St. Kitts he was going to set up a Caribbean development bank. He told the prime minister there, and he was going to put a billion dollars in that bank for Caribbean development. Just listening to this confession by Louis Farrakhan and trying to picture Gaddafi's vision, not just for Libya, but the whole of Africa in general, sends tears down our cheeks. What a visionary leader he was. We have conducted extensive research on the life of Muammar Gaddafi, including his political and socio-economic endeavors and failures. Through this video, we will learn about who he was. We will present some facts about Gaddafi's one piece intent for Africa, which ultimately led to his downfall. It is up to you to decide who he truly was.
please do not forget to subscribe to our channel and turn on post notifications so you don't miss any of our future uploads. Let's begin by examining Libya's condition before Muammar al-Gaddafi came to power. Post-World War II, Libya was divided between France and the United Kingdom, administratively linked to their colonies in Algeria and Tunisia. The UK supported the establishment of a monarchy, the Senussi dynasty, controlled by Saudi Arabia and endorsed by the UN. This dynasty ruled Libya under King Idris I, who maintained the country in a state of obscurity while advancing British economic and military interests. The discovery of oil reserves in 1959 did not lead to significant benefits for the population. According to political analyst Thierry Maison, under the monarchy, Libya lagged in education, healthcare, housing, and social security. Shockingly, the literacy rate was extremely low, with only 250,000 out of 4 million inhabitants able to read and write. In 1969, Colonel Muammar al-Gaddafi and a group of officers overthrew the Senussi dynasty, ushering in true independence and removing foreign dominance from the nation. One of Gaddafi's immediate actions was to ensure equitable distribution of wealth and resources to all Libyans. Since assuming power, Gaddafi has placed considerable emphasis on oil as the primary resource under the newly established Libyan Arab Republic. The success of the 1969 revolution marked a significant shift, prompting the new government to utilize oil revenues for implementing redistributive measures among the populace, initiating a novel model of economic and social progress within the nation. According to analysts, Gaddafi's policies of economic sovereignty included actions like nationalizing several Western oil companies, such as British Petroleum, BP, and establishing the National Oil Corporation, NOC, which shaped a more socialist framework. Throughout Gaddafi's rule, ambitious social initiatives were launched, covering education, healthcare, housing, infrastructure, and subsidies for essential utilities and food items. These initiatives led to a substantial enhancement in the living standards of Libyans, transforming the country from one of Africa's poorest nations in 1969 to the continent's leader in the Human Development Index by 2011. Actually, Libya was ranked as a high-development nation in the Middle East and North Africa by the United Nations Development Programme, 2010. In addition to several other favourable indicators, this translated status meant an 88.4% literacy rate, a 74.5-year life expectancy and gender equality. Did you know that the following facts are true about Gaddafi's Libya? 1. Electricity is free for all Libyans. 2. Loans in Libya are free with 0% interest as banks are state-owned. 3. Homes are considered a human right in Libya. Gaddafi vowed that his parents would not get a house until everyone in Libya had a home. Gaddafi's father died while he, his wife, and his mother were still living in a tent. 4. All newly married people in Libya receive US dollar 50,000 from the government to buy their first home to help the new family. 5. Medical treatment and education are free in Libya. Before Colonel Muammar Gaddafi ruled the country, only 25% of Libyans were literate. 6. If Libyans wanted to take up farming as a career, the government funded people from equipment to seeds, all for free. 7. The government subsidized 50% of the price of a new car if a Libyan citizen wanted to buy their first car. 8. Petrol price in Libya is around 14 cents per litre. 9. Libya has no debt externally and its reserves amount to $150 billion, now globally frozen. 10. The Libyan government would fund anyone who got a degree, and if they could not get employment, they would receive income as if they were employed until they got a job. 11. The sale of Libyan oil is credited directly to the bank accounts of all Libyan citizens in proportion. 12. A family would get US $5,000 if they had a new baby to support the child's upbringing. 13. 40 loaves of bread in Libya costs around 15 cents, 14. 25% of Libyans have a university degree. After all this, do you still think Colonel Muammar Gaddafi was really a bad leader? Let us listen to this extract of the most famous speech he made at the 64th United Nations General Assembly in 2009. The name of the African Union, I would like to greet the members of the General Assembly of the United Nations 
and I hope that this meeting will be among the most historic in the history of the world. In the name of the General Assembly at its 64th session, presided over by Libya, of the African Union, of 1,000 traditional African kingdoms, and in my name, I would like to take this opportunity, as President of the African Union, to congratulate our son Obama because he is attending the General Assembly, and we welcome him as his country is hosting this meeting. This session is taking place amid so many challenges facing us, and the whole world should come together and unite its efforts to defeat the challenges that are our principal common enemy, those of climate change and international crises such as the capitalist economic decline, the food and water crises, desertification, terrorism, immigration, piracy, man-made and natural epidemics, and nuclear proliferation. Perhaps influenza H1N1 was a virus created in a laboratory that got out of control, originally meant as a military weapon. Such challenges also include hypocrisy, poverty, fear, materialism, and immorality. As is known, the United Nations was founded by three or four countries against Germany at the time. The United Nations was formed by the nations that joined together against Germany in the Second World War. Those countries formed a body called the Security Council, made their own countries permanent members, and granted them the power of veto. We were not present at that time. The United Nations was shaped in line with those three countries and wanted us to step into shoes originally designed against Germany. That is the real substance of the United Nations when it was founded over 60 years ago. That happened in the absence of some 165 countries at a ratio of one to eight. That is, one was present and eight were absent. They created the Charter, of which I have a copy. If one reads the Charter of the United Nations, one finds that the preamble of the Charter differs from its articles. How did it come into existence? All those who attended the San Francisco Conference in 1945 participated in creating the preamble, but they left the articles and internal rules of procedures of the so-called Security Council to experts, specialists, and interested countries, which were those countries that had established the Security Council and had united against Germany. The preamble is very appealing, and no one objects to it, but all the provisions that follow it completely contradict the preamble. We reject such provisions, and we will never uphold them. They ended with the Second World War. The preamble says that all nations, small or large, are equal. Are we equal when it comes to the permanent seats? No, we are not equal. The preamble states in writing that all nations are equal whether they are small or large. Do we have the right of veto? Are we equal? The preamble says that we have equal rights, whether we are large or small. That is what is stated and what we agreed in the preamble. So the veto contradicts the Charter. The permanent seats contradict the Charter. We neither accept nor recognize the veto. The preamble of the Charter states that armed force shall not be used, save in the common interest. That is the preamble that we agreed to and signed, and we joined the United Nations because we wanted the Charter to reflect that. It says that armed force shall only be used in the common interest of all nations. But what has happened since then? 65 wars have broken out since the establishment of the United Nations and the Security Council. 65 since their creation, with millions more victims than in the Second World War. Are those wars and the aggression and force used in those 65 wars in the common interest of us all? No, they were in the interest of one or three or four countries, but not of all nations. We will talk about whether those wars were in the interest of one country or of all nations that flagrantly contradicts the Charter of the United Nations that we signed. And unless we act following the Charter of the United Nations to which we agreed, we will reject it and not be afraid not to speak diplomatically to anyone. Now we are talking about the future of the United Nations. There should be no hypocrisy or diplomacy because it concerns the vital issue of the future of the world. It was hypocrisy that brought about the 65 wars since the establishment of the United Nations. The preamble also states that if armed force is used, it must be a United Nations force. Thus, military intervention by the United Nations, with the joint agreement of the United Nations, not one, two or three countries using armed force. The entire United Nations will decide to go to war to maintain international peace and security. 
Since the establishment of the United Nations in 1945, if there is an act of aggression by one country against another, the entire United Nations should deter and stop that act. If a country, Libya for instance, were to exhibit aggression against France, then the entire organization would respond because France is a sovereign state member of the United Nations and we all share the collective responsibility to protect the sovereignty of all nations. However, 65 aggressive wars have taken place without any United Nations action to prevent them. Eight other massive fierce wars, whose victims number some two million, have been waged by member states that enjoy veto powers. Those countries that would have us believe they seek to maintain the sovereignty and independence of people use aggressive force against people. While we would like to believe that these countries want to work for peace and security in the world and protect people, they have instead resorted to aggressive wars and hostile behavior. Enjoying the veto, they granted themselves as permanent members of the Security Council. They have initiated wars that have claimed millions of victims. The principle of non-interference in the internal affairs of states is enshrined in the Charter of the United Nations. No country, therefore, has the right to interfere in the affairs of any government, be it democratic or dictatorial, socialist or capitalist, reactionary or progressive. This is the responsibility of each society. It is an internal matter for the people of the country concerned. The senators of Rome once appointed their leader, Julius Caesar, as dictator because it was good for Rome at that time. No one can say of Rome at that time that it gave Caesar the veto. The veto is not mentioned in the Charter. We joined the United Nations because we thought we were equals, only to find that one country can object to all the decisions we make. Who gave the permanent members their status in the Security Council? Four of them granted this status to themselves. The only country that we in this assembly elected to permanent member status in the Security Council is China. This was done democratically, but the other seats were imposed upon us undemocratically through a dictatorial procedure carried out against our will, and we should not accept it. The Security Council reform we need is not an increase in the number of members, which would only make things worse. To use a common expression, if you add more water, you get more mud. It would add insult to injury. It would make things worse simply by adding more large countries to those that already enjoy membership in the Council. It would merely perpetuate the proliferation of superpowers. We therefore reject the addition of any more permanent seats. The solution is not to have more permanent seats, which would be very dangerous. Adding more superpowers would crush the peoples of small, vulnerable and third world countries, which are coming together in what has been called the Group of 100. 100 small countries banding together in a forum that one member has called the Forum of Small States. These countries would be crushed by superpowers were additional large countries to be granted membership in the Security Council. This door must be closed. We reject it strongly and categorically. Adding more seats to the Security Council would increase poverty, injustice and tension at the world level, as well as great competition between certain countries such as Italy, Germany, Indonesia, India, Pakistan, the Philippines, Japan, Brazil, Nigeria, Argentina, Algeria, Libya, Egypt, the Democratic Republic of the Congo, South Africa, Tanzania, Turkey, Iran, Greece and Ukraine. All these countries would seek a seat on the Security Council, making its membership almost as large as that of the General Assembly and resulting in impractical competition. What solution can there be? The solution is for the General Assembly to adopt a binding resolution under the leadership of Mr. Treki based on the majority will of Assembly members and taking into account the considerations of no other body. The solution is to close Security Council membership to the admission of further states. This item is on the agenda of the General Assembly during the present session presided over by Mr. Trecky. Membership through unions and the transference of mandates should supersede other proposals. We should focus on the achievement of democracy based on the equality of member states. There should be equality among member states and the powers and mandates of the Security Council should be transferred to the General Assembly. Membership should be for unions, not for states. Increasing the number of state members would give the right to all countries to a seat, following the spirit of the preamble of the Charter. No country 
could deny a seat in the Council to Italy, for instance, if a seat were given to Germany. For the sake of argument, Italy might say that Germany was an aggressive country and was defeated in the Second World War. If we gave India a seat, Pakistan would say that it, too, is a nuclear country and deserves a seat, and those two countries are at war. This would be a dangerous situation. If we give a seat to Japan, then we should have to give one to Indonesia, the largest Muslim country in the world. Then Turkey, Iran and Ukraine would make the same claim. What could we say to Argentina or Brazil? Libya deserves a seat for its efforts in the service of world security by discarding its weapons of mass destruction program. Then South Africa, Tanzania and Ukraine would demand the same. All of these countries are important. The door to Security Council membership should be closed. This approach is a falsehood, a trick that has been exposed. If we want to reform the United Nations, bringing in more superpowers is not the way. The solution is to foster democracy at the level of the General Congress of the World, the General Assembly, to which the powers of the Security Council should be transferred. The Security Council would become merely an instrument for implementing the decisions taken by the General Assembly, which would be the Parliament, the Legislative Assembly of the world. This Assembly is our democratic forum and the Security Council should be responsible before it. We should not accept the current situation. These are the legislators of the members of the United Nations and their resolutions should be binding. It is said that the General Assembly should do whatever the Security Council recommends. On the contrary, the Security Council should do whatever the General Assembly decides. This is the United Nations, the Assembly that includes 192 countries. It is not the Security Council, which includes only 15 of the member states. How can we be happy about global peace and security if the whole world is controlled by only five countries? We are 192 nations and countries, and we are like Speaker's Corner in London's Hyde Park. We just speak, and nobody implements our decisions. We are mere decorations without any real substance. We are Speaker's Corner, no more, no less. We just make speeches and then disappear. This is who you are right now. Once the Security Council becomes only an executive body for resolutions adopted by the General Assembly, there will be no competition for membership of the Council. Once the Security Council becomes a tool to implement General Assembly resolutions, there will be no need for any competition. The Security Council should quite simply represent all nations. By the proposal submitted to the General Assembly, there would be permanent seats on the Security Council for all unions and groups of countries. The 27 countries of the European Union should have a permanent seat on the Security Council. The countries of the African Union should have a permanent seat on the Security Council. The Latin American and Asian countries should have permanent seats. The Russian Federation and the United States of America are already permanent members of the Security Council. The Southern African Development Community, SADC, once it is fully established, should have a permanent seat. The 22 countries of the Arab League should have a permanent seat. The 57 countries of the Islamic Conference should have a permanent seat. The 118 countries of the Non-Aligned Movement should have a permanent seat. Then there is the G100. Perhaps the small countries should also have a permanent seat. Countries not included in the unions that I have mentioned could perhaps be assigned a permanent seat to be occupied by them in rotation every six or 12 months. I'm thinking of countries like Japan and Australia that are outside such organizations as ASEAN or like the Russian Federation that is not a member of the European Latin American or African unions. This would be a solution for them if the General Assembly votes in favor of it. The issue is a vitally important one. As has already been mentioned, the General Assembly is the Congress and Parliament of the world, the leader of the world. We are the nations, and anyone outside this General Assembly will not be recognized. The President of the Assembly, Mr. Ali Abdusalam Treki, and Secretary General Ban Ki-moon will produce the legal draft and set up the necessary committees to submit this proposal to a vote. From now on, the Security Council will be made up of unions of nations. In this way, we will have justice and democracy, and we will no longer have a Security Council consisting of countries that have been chosen because they have nuclear weapons, large economies, or advanced technology. That is terrorism. 
We cannot allow the Security Council to be run by superpowers. That is terrorism in and of itself. If we want a world that is united, safe and peaceful, this is what we should do. If we want to remain in a world at war, that is up to you. We will continue to have conflict and to fight until doomsday or the end of the world. All Security Council members should have the right to exercise the veto, or else we should eliminate the whole concept of the veto with this new formation of the Council. This would be a real Security Council. According to the new proposals submitted to the General Assembly, it will be an Executive Council under the control of the General Assembly, which will have the real power and make all the rules. In this way, all countries will be on an equal footing in the Security Council, just as they are in the General Assembly. In the General Assembly, we are all treated equally when it comes to membership and voting. It should be the same in the Security Council. Currently, one country has a veto. Another country does not have a veto. One country has a permanent seat. Another country does not have a permanent seat. We should not accept this, nor should we accept any resolution adopted by the Security Council in its current composition. We were under trusteeship, we were colonized, and now we are independent. We are here today to decide the future of the world in a democratic way that will maintain the peace and security of all nations, large and small, as equals. Otherwise, it is terrorism. For terrorism is not just Al-Qaeda, but can also take other forms. We should be guided by the majority of the votes in the General Assembly alone. If the General Assembly decides by voting, then its wishes should be obeyed and its decision should be enforced. No one is above the General Assembly. Anyone who says he is above the Assembly should leave the United Nations and be on his own. Democracy is not for the rich or the most powerful or for those who practice terrorism. All nations should be and should be seen to be on an equal footing. At present, the Security Council is security feudalism, political feudalism for those with permanent seats, protected by them and used against us. It should be called not the Security Council, but the Terror Council. In our political life, if they need to use the Security Council against us, they turn to the Security Council. If they do not need to use it against us, they ignore the Security Council. If they have an interest to promote, an axe to grind, they respect and glorify the Charter of the United Nations. They turn to Chapter 7 of the Charter and use it against poor nations. If, however, they wish to violate the Charter, they would ignore it as if it did not exist at all. If the veto of the permanent members of the Security Council is given to those who have the power, this is injustice and terrorism and should not be tolerated by us. We should not live in the shadow of this injustice and terror. Superpowers have complicated global interests and they use the veto to protect those interests. For example, the Security Council uses the power of the United Nations to protect their interests and to terrorize and intimidate the Third World, causing it to live under the shadow of terror. From the beginning, since it was established in 1945, the Security Council has failed to provide security. On the contrary, it has provided terror and sanctions. It is only used against us. For this reason, we will no longer be committed to implementing Security Council resolutions after this speech, which marks the 40th anniversary. 65 wars have broken out, either fighting among small countries or wars of aggression waged against us by superpowers. The Security Council, in clear violation of the Charter of the United Nations, failed to take action to stop these wars or acts of aggression against small nations and peoples. The General Assembly will vote on several historic proposals. Either we act as one or we will fragment. If each nation were to have its version of the General Assembly, the Security Council and the various instruments, and each were to have an equal footing, the powers that currently fill the permanent seats would be confined to the use of their sovereign bodies, whether there be three or four of them, and would have to exercise their rights against themselves. This is of no concern to us. If they want to keep their permanent seats, that is fine. Permanent seats will be of no concern to us. We shall never submit to their control or to their exercise of the veto that was given to them. We are not so foolish as to give the right of veto to the superpowers to use so they can treat us as second-class citizens and as outcast nations. It is not we who decided that those countries are the superpowers 
and respected nations with the power to act on behalf of 192 countries. You should be fully aware that we are ignoring the Security Council resolutions because those resolutions are used solely against us and not against the superpowers which have the permanent seats and the right of veto. Those powers never use any resolutions against themselves. They are, however, used against us. Such use has turned the United Nations into a travesty of itself and has generated wars and violations of the sovereignty of independent states. It has led to war crimes and genocides. All of this violates the Charter of the United Nations. Since no one pays attention to the Security Council of the United Nations, each country and community has established its Security Council, and the Security Council here has become isolated. The African Union has already established its own Peace and Security Council, the European Union has already established a Security Council, and Asian countries have already established their Security Council. Soon, Latin America will have its own Security Council, L as will the 120 non-aligned nations. This means that we have already lost confidence in the United Nations Security Council, which has not provided us with security. And that is why we now are creating new regional security councils. We are not committed to obeying the rules or the resolutions of the United Nations Security Council in its present form, because it is undemocratic, dictatorial, and unjust. No one can force us to join the Security Council or to obey or comply with resolutions or orders given by the Security Council in its present composition. Furthermore, there is no respect for the United Nations and no regard for the General Assembly, which is the true United Nations, but whose resolutions are non-binding. The decisions of the International Court of Justice, the International Judicial Body, aim only at small countries and third world nations. Powerful countries escape the notice of the court, or if judicial decisions are taken against these powerful countries, they are not enforced. The International Atomic Energy Agency, IEEA, is an important agency within the United Nations. Powerful countries, however, are not accountable to it or under its jurisdiction. We have discovered that the IAA is used only against us. We are told that it is an international organization, but if that is the case, then all the countries of the world should be under its jurisdiction. If it is not truly international, then right after this speech, we should no longer accept it and should close it down. Mr. Trecky, in his capacity as President of the General Assembly, should talk to the Director General of the IAEA, Mr. Elbaradi, and should ask him if he is prepared to verify nuclear energy storage in all countries and inspect all suspected increases. If he says yes, then we accept the agency's jurisdiction. But if he says that he cannot go into certain countries that have nuclear power and that he does not have any jurisdiction over them, then we should close the agency down and not submit to its jurisdiction. For your information, I called Mr. El Baradei when we had the problem of the Libyan nuclear bomb. I called Mr. El Baradei and asked him if the agreements by the superpowers to reduce nuclear supplies were subject to agency control and under inspection, and whether he was aware of any increases in their activity. He told me that he was not in a position to ask the superpowers to be inspected. So, is the agency only inspecting us? If so, it does not qualify as an international organization since it is selective, just like the Security Council and the International Court of Justice. This is not equitable, nor is it the United Nations. We totally reject this situation. Regarding Africa, Mr. President, whether the United Nations is reformed or not, and even before a vote is taken on any proposals of a historic nature, Africa should be given a permanent seat on the Security Council now, having already waited too long. Leaving aside United Nations reform, we can certainly say that Africa was colonized, isolated, and persecuted, and its rights usurped. Its people were enslaved and treated like animals, and its territory was colonized and placed under trusteeship. The countries of the African Union deserve a permanent seat. This is a debt from the past that has to be paid and has nothing to do with United Nations reform. It is a priority matter and is high on the agenda of the General Assembly. No one can say that the African Union does not deserve a permanent seat. Who can argue with this proposal? I challenge anyone to make a case against it. Where is the proof that the African Union or the African continent does not deserve a permanent seat? No one can deny this. 
Another matter that should be voted on in the General Assembly is that of compensation for countries that were colonized. To prevent the colonization of a continent, the usurpation of its rights and the pillaging of its wealth from happening again. Why are Africans going to Europe? Why are Asians going to Europe? Why are Latin Americans going to Europe? It is because Europe colonized those peoples and stole the material and human resources of Africa, Asia, and Latin America. The oil, minerals, uranium, gold, and diamonds, the fruit, vegetables, and livestock, and the people, and used them. Now new generations of Asians, Latin Americans, and Africans are seeking to reclaim that stolen wealth as they have the right to do. At the Libyan border, I recently stopped 1,000 African migrants headed for Europe. I asked them why they were going there. They told me it was to take back their stolen wealth, that they would not be leaving otherwise. Who can restore the wealth that was taken from us? If you decide to restore all of this wealth, there will be no more immigration from the Philippines, Latin America, Mauritius, and India. Let us have the wealth that was stolen from us. Africa deserves $777 trillion in compensation from the countries that colonized it. Africans will demand that amount, and if you do not give it to them, they will go to where you have taken those trillions of dollars. They have the right to do so. They have to follow that money and bring it back. Why is there no Libyan immigration to Italy, even though Libya is so close by? Italy owed compensation to the Libyan people. It accepted that fact and signed an agreement with Libya which was adopted by both the Italian and Libyan parliaments. Italy admitted that its colonization of Libya was wrong and should never be repeated, and it promised not to attack the Libyan people by land, air, or sea. Italy also agreed to provide Libya with $250 million a year in compensation over the next 20 years and to build a hospital for Libyans maimed as a result of the mines planted in Libyan territory during the Second World War. Italy apologized and promised that it would never again occupy the territory of another country. Italy, which was a kingdom during the fascist regime and has made rich contributions to civilization, should be commended for this achievement, together with Prime Minister Berlusconi and his predecessor, who made their contributions in that regard. Why is the Third World demanding compensation? So that there will be no more colonization, so that large and powerful countries will not colonize, knowing that they will have to pay compensation. Colonization should be punished. The countries that harmed other peoples during the colonial era should pay compensation for the damage and suffering inflicted under their colonial rule. There's another point that I would like to make. However, before doing so, and addressing a somewhat sensitive issue, I would like to make an aside. We Africans are happy and proud indeed that a son of Africa is now President of the United States of America. That is a historic event. Now, in a country where blacks once could not mingle with whites in cafes or restaurants or sit next to them on a bus, the American people have elected as their president a young black man, Mr. Obama, of Kenyan heritage. That is a wonderful thing, and we are proud. It marks the beginning of a change. However, as far as I am concerned, Obama is a temporary relief for the next four or eight years. I am afraid that we may then go back to square one. No one can guarantee how America will be governed after Obama. We would be content if Obama could remain President of the United States of America forever. The statement that he just made shows that he is completely different from any American president that we have seen. American presidents used to threaten us with all manner of weapons, saying that they would send us desert storm, grapes of wrath, rolling thunder, and poisonous roses for Libyan children. That was their approach. American presidents used to threaten us with operations such as Rolling Thunder, sent to Vietnam, Desert Storm, sent to Iraq, Musketeer, sent to Egypt in 1956, even though America opposed it, and the poisonous roses visited upon Libyan children by Reagan. Can you imagine? One would have thought that presidents of a large country with a permanent seat on the Security Council and the right of veto would have protected us and sent us peace. And what did we get instead? Laser-guided bombs were carried to us on F-111 aircraft. This was their approach. We will lead the world, whether you like it or not, and will punish anyone who opposes us. What our son Obama said today is completely different. He made a serious appeal for nuclear disarmament, which we applaud. 
He also said that America alone could not solve the problems facing us and that the entire world should come together to do so. He said that we must do more than we are doing now, which is making speeches. We agree with that and applaud it. He said that we had come to the United Nations to talk against one another. It is true that when we come here, we should communicate with one another on an equal footing. And he said that democracy should not be imposed from outside. Until recently, American presidents have said that democracy should be imposed on Iraq and other countries. He said that this was an internal affair. He spoke truly when he said that democracy cannot be imposed from outside. So we have to be cautious. Before I make these sensitive remarks, I note that the whole world has so many polarities. Listen, should we have a world of so many polarities? Can we not have nations on an equal footing? Let us have an answer. Does anyone have an answer as to whether it is better to have a world of so many polarities? Why can we not have equal standing? Should we have patriarchs? Should we have popes? Should we have gods? Why should we have a world of so many polarities? We reject such a world and call for a world where big and small are equal. The other sensitive point is the headquarters of the United Nations. Can I have your attention, please? All of you came across the Atlantic Ocean, the Pacific Ocean, crossing the Asian continent or the African continent to reach this place. Why? Is this Jerusalem? Is this the Vatican? Is this Mecca? All of you are tired, have jet lag, and have sleepless nights. You are very tired, very low, physically. Somebody just arrived now, flying 20 hours. Then we want him to make a speech and talk about this. All of you are asleep, all of you are tired. All of you are lacking energy because of having to make a long journey. Why do we do that? Some of our countries are at nighttime and people are asleep. Now you should be asleep because your biological clock, your biological mind is accustomed to being asleep at this time. I wake up at four o'clock New York time before dawn because in Libya it is 11 in the morning. When I wake up at 11 o'clock, it is supposed to be daytime. At four o'clock, I am awake. Why? Think about it. If this was decided in 1945, should we still retain it? Why can we not think about a place that is in the middle, that is comfortable? Another important point is that America, the host country, bears the expenses and looks after the headquarters and diplomatic missions and looks after the peace and security of the heads of state who come here. They are very strict. They spend a lot of money New York and all of America being very tight. I want to relieve America of this hardship. We should thank America. We say to America, thank you for all the trouble that you have taken on yourself. We say thank you to America. We want to help reassure America and New York and keep them calm. They should not have the responsibility of looking after security. Perhaps someday a terrorist could cause an explosion or bomb a president. This place is targeted by Al Qaeda, this very building. Why was it not hit on the 11th of September? It was beyond their power. The next target would be this place. I am not saying this in an offhand manner. We have tens of members of Al-Qaeda detained in Libyan prisons. Their confessions are very scary. That makes America live under tension. One never knows what will happen. Perhaps America or this place will be targeted again by a rocket. Perhaps tens of heads of state will die. We want to relieve America from this worry. We shall take the place where it is not targeted. Now, after 50 years, the United Nations headquarters should be taken to another part of the hemisphere. After 50 years in the Western Hemisphere, for the next 50 years, it should be in the Eastern Hemisphere or in the Middle Hemisphere by rotation. Now, with 64 years, we have an extra 14 years over the 50 that headquarters should have been moved to somewhere else. This is not an insult to America. It is a service to America. We should thank America. This was possible in 1945, but we should not accept it now. Of course, this should be put to the vote in the General Assembly, only in the Assembly, because Section 23 of the Headquarters Agreement says that the United Nations Headquarters can be moved to another location only by a resolution of the General Assembly. If 51% of the Assembly approves the relocation of the Headquarters, then it can be moved. America has the right to make security tight because it is targeted by terrorists and by Al-Qaeda. America has the right to take all security measures. We are not blaming America for that. However, we do not tolerate these measures. We do not have to come to New York and be subjected to all these measures. One president told me that he was told that his co-pilot should not come to America because there were restrictions. 
He asked how he could cross the Atlantic without a co-pilot. Why? He does not have to come here. Another president complained that his honor guard could not come because there was some misunderstanding regarding his name when it came to granting a visa. Another president said his doctor could not get a visa and could not come to America. The security measures are very strict. If a country has any problem with America, they will set up restrictions on the movements of member delegations, as if one is in Guantanamo. Is this a member state of the United Nations, or is it a prisoner in the Guantanamo camp that cannot be allowed free movement? This is what is submitted to the General Assembly for a vote, moving the headquarters. If 51% agree, then we come to the second vote, to the middle of the globe or to the eastern part. If we say that we must move the headquarters to the middle of the hemisphere, why do we not move to Sirte or Vienna? One can come even without a visa. Once you become a president, Libya is a secure country. We are not going to restrict you to 100 or 500 meters. Libya has no hostile actions against anybody. I think the same holds for Vienna. If the vote says we should move headquarters to the eastern part, then it will be Delhi or Beijing, the capital of China or the capital of India. That is logical, my brothers. I do not think there will be any objection to that. Then you will thank me for this proposal, for eliminating the suffering and the trouble of flying 14, 15 or 20 hours to come here. No one can blame America or say that America will reduce its contributions to the United Nations. No one should have that bad thought. America, I am sure, is committed to its international obligations. America will not be angry. It will thank you for alleviating its hardship, for taking on all that hardship and all the restrictions. Even though this place is targeted by terrorists, we come now to the issues that will be considered by the General Assembly. We are about to put the United Nations on trial, the old organization will be finished, and a new one will emerge. This is not a normal gathering. Even son Obama said that this is not a normal gathering. It is a historic meeting. The wars that took place after the establishment of the United Nations. Why did they occur? Where was the Security Council? Where was the Charter? Where was the United Nations? There should be investigations and judicial intervention. Why have there been massacres? We can start with the Korean War because it took place after the establishment of the United Nations. How did a war break out and cause millions of victims? Nuclear weapons could have been used in that war. Those who are responsible for causing the war should be tried and should pay compensation and damages. Then we come to the Suez Canal War of 1956. That file should be opened wide. Three countries with permanent seats on the Security Council and with the right of veto in the Council attacked a member state of this General Assembly. A country that was a sovereign state, Egypt, was attacked. Its army was destroyed. Thousands of Egyptians were killed and many Egyptian towns and entities were destroyed, all because Egypt wanted to nationalize the Suez Canal. How could such a thing have happened during the era of the United Nations and its charter? How is it possible to guarantee that such a thing will not be repeated unless we make amends for past wrongs? Those were dangerous events, and the Suez Canal and Korean War files should be reopened. Next, we come to the Vietnam War. There were three million victims of that war. During 12 days, more bombs were dropped than during four years of the Second World War. It was a fiercer war, and it took place after the establishment of the United Nations, and after we had decided that there would be no more wars. The future of humankind is at stake. We cannot stay silent. How can we feel safe? How can we be complacent? This is the future of the world, and we who are in the General Assembly of the United Nations must make sure that such wars are not repeated in the future. Then Panama was attacked, even though it was an independent member, state of the General Assembly. 4,000 people were killed, and the president of that country was taken prisoner and put in prison. Noriega should be released. We should open that file. How can we entitle a country that is a United Nations member state to wage war against another country and capture its president, treat him as a criminal and put him in prison? Who would accept that? It could be repeated. We should not stay quiet. We should have an investigation. Any one of us member states could face the same situation, especially if such aggression is by a member state with a permanent seat on the Security Council and with the responsibility to maintain peace and security worldwide. The list above shows that 
if he kept to the provision of the list, Muammar Gaddafi tried to provide for the people of Libya as much as he could. It was democracy that the Libyan people wanted, but had to fight to the death to get it. Democracy is a weapon being used by the West in the Middle East to start protests and uprisings by the people in those countries, because most of the Middle Eastern countries are still being ruled under the Islamic Sharia law. To break the mold and for the West to infiltrate the Middle East, democracy is an easy weapon to use, or you could also call it propaganda. Although we are in the 21st century, Islam is a religion that is forever. But when people in the Middle East look at the way Western countries are ruled, the people of the Middle East want a democracy in their countries. Islam does not support a dictatorship regime, so the leaders of those countries should rule with democracy. There is no contradiction here, as the truth is that in the time of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, there was democracy and Islam was perfect, the law and ruling were perfect. It was run according to the Sharia law. Islam is and has been perfected by Allah, as it is written in the Quran, but it is human beings who make it difficult for themselves. Here's what a few notable citizens of the Middle East think of Gaddafi. J. Krishnanman, on November 11, 2019. To break the mold and for the West to infiltrate the Middle East, democracy is an easy weapon to use, or you could also call it propaganda. Although we are in the 21st century, Islam is a religion that is forever. The West blamed Gaddafi for the Lockerbie plane crash, and America, Britain and France have done far worse things than Saddam Hussein, colonial Gaddafi Che, and other so-called tyrants together. The West has double standards and are hypocrites. Samuel C. Carpenter on July 28, 2019. I have been to Arab countries and many Arab friends. Never fail in hospitality and politeness, religious and respectful. I have known Jewish people as well, many of whom know nothing but how to be offensive, as it is their belief system and they know no other way of being. Still, Jews seem to have a drive to succeed, usually discriminate against others. Ibrahim Fajani on May 27, 2018. They'll realize they've made the biggest mistake in their lives when they killed their leader, when the West steps on their faces, stole their resources, and made them slaves to what is called democracy, but more like poverty. That's what we got in Tunisia poverty. That's what democracy did to us. I don't need freedom of speech when I'm starving. I miss the days under the Ben Ali regime. Everything was cheap. We used to get everything and still save extra money. Life was good. Now look at us with democracy living in absolute poverty. I don't want your F asterisk 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 in democracy. The biggest lie in the history of humanity. Gaddafi did not end his speech at the UN General Assembly without emphasizing the need for the entire world to strive for the protection of all countries' citizens, as he went on. The entire world should strive to protect our people, create and manufacture vaccinations, and give them free to children and women, and not profit from them. All those items are on the agenda of the General Assembly, which has only to exercise that duty. The Ottawa Convention on Landmines forbids the production of landmines. That is wrong. Landmines are defensive weapons. If I place them along the border of my country and someone wants to invade me, they may be killed. That is all right, because they are invading me. The convention should be reconsidered. I am not taking that defensive weapon to another country. The enemy is coming to me. On the al qadhafi website, I call for that treaty to be modified or annulled. This treaty should be modified or annulled. I want to use anti-personnel mines to defend my home against invasion. Eliminate weapons of mass destruction, not landmines, which are defensive weapons. About the Palestinian situation, the two-state solution is impossible. It is not practical. Currently, these two states completely overlap. Partition is doomed to failure. These two states are not neighbors. They are coextensive in terms of both population and geography. A buffer zone cannot be created between the two states because there are half a million Israeli settlers in the West Bank and a million Arab Palestinians in the territory known as Israel. The solution is therefore a democratic state without religious fanaticism or ethnicity. The generation of Sharon and Arafat is over. We need a new generation in which everyone can live in peace. Look at Palestinian and Israeli youth. They both want peace and democracy and they want to live under one state. This conflict poisons the world 
The white book has the solution. I hold it here. The solution is Isratine. Arabs have no hostility or animosity towards Israel. We are cousins and of the same race. We want to live in peace. The refugees should go back. You are the ones who brought the Holocaust upon the Jews. You, not we, are the ones who burned them. We gave them refuge. We gave them haven during the Roman era, the Arab reign in Andalusia, and the rule of Hitler. You are the ones who poisoned them. You are the ones who annihilated them. We provided them with protection. You expelled them. Let us see the truth. We are not hostile. We are not enemies of the Jews. And one day, the Jews will need the Arabs. At that point, Arabs will be the ones to give them protection, to save them, as we have done in the past. Look at what everybody else did to the Jews. Hitler is an example. You are the ones who hate the Jews, not us. In brief, Kashmir should be an independent state, neither Indian nor Pakistani. We must end that conflict. Kashmir should be a buffer state between India and Pakistan. About Darfur, I truly hope that the assistance provided by international organizations can be used for development projects, agriculture, industry, and irrigation. You are the ones who made it a crisis. You put it on the altar. You wanted to sacrifice Darfur so that you could interfere in its internal affairs. You have turned the Hariri problem into a United Nations problem. You are selling Hariri's corpse. You just want to settle scores with Syria. Lebanon is an independent state. It has laws, courts, a judiciary, and police. At this stage, it is no longer the perpetrators that are being sought. The real wish is to settle scores with Syria, not ensure justice for Hariri. The cases of Khalil al-Wazir, Lumumba, Kennedy, and Hamarskjold should also have been turned over to the United Nations if the Hariri case merits such attention. The General Assembly is now under the presidency of Libya. This is our right. Libya hopes that you will assist in making the transition from a world fraught with crises and tension to a world in which humanity, peace and tolerance prevail. I will personally follow up on this issue with the General Assembly, President Treki and the Secretary General. It is not our habit to compromise when it comes to the destiny of humanity and the struggles of the Third World and the 100 small nations, which should live in peace always. Gaddafi's aptitude at the national level at the national level, Gaddafi was able to deal with two central dilemmas characteristic of Libyan society. On the one hand, the difficulty of exercising control over the tribes, and on the other, the fragmentation of society into diverse and sometimes opposite tribal and regional groups. Gaddafi could hold together these territories with little connection to each other. It is estimated that there are about 140 tribes in the Libyan territory, each with different traditions and origins. At the international level, pan-Arabism should be highlighted with the confrontation open to the United States due to the opposition that Gaddafi exerted on the influence of this country, reaching closer ties with other Arab countries to carry out common policies of rejection of Washington's policies on the Middle East and Africa. The Libyan leader worked to strengthen ties with neighboring countries such as Egypt, Morocco, Syria, Tunisia and Chad, among others, as well as maintaining close relations with countries like France and Russia. Gaddafi also connected with Latin American countries such as Venezuela and Cuba, which led him to cultivate an extensive network of contacts and uncomfortable influence on Europe and the US. So did he deserve to be dragged like a street dog on the hard stony ground and battered by rebel forces in association with US assistance? Did he deserve to be painted black and isolated? Was he ever granted his pan-Africanist demands and did not fulfill his promises? How different is the West in their capturing and torturing to death of Libya's most iconic leader to the absolute dictatorship governance they oppose? By the time of his killing, Libya had the highest GDP per capita and life expectancy on the continent. Fewer people live below the poverty line than in the Netherlands. Here is a man who advocated for peace, wanted peace, lived for peace, and culminated his life in hopes of one peace for Africa at large. But the West was too scared of the prospects of the realization of his dream and found political hypocritic ways to snuff him out. That brings us to the end of this video. Let us know what you think about the West's intention for Africa in the comment section below. Also, share this video with some and click on the notification icon to get notified of our future uploads.